Media Live event. My name is Jessica Chen, and I'm so excited you are all here. I was just looking in the chat function, and it's so amazing to see the diversity in terms of where folks are dialing in from. And, you know, that's the beauty of doing an event like this is you can really have and include folks from all over. So, of course, welcome, whether it's your morning, your afternoon, or hey, maybe it could be your evening if you're dialing in from international, which I have to say, we are so grateful wherever you are dialing in from that you are here. So today we have a very, very special event and I'm so excited to get started. But before we do, I wanted to do a quick intro of what this event is. If this is the first time you're joining me on our Soulcast Media Live event, I'm so happy you're here. I host these about every other week or so, and I always have amazing guests, including the one today, where we talk all things career communications. And the fact that you are all here taking your time, whether you're driving, listening, or watching us, I'm so excited to share that we are going to be sharing some really amazing tips on how to go job shopping not job searching. Isn't it such a really, to me personally, I love that switch in mentality because, you know, for many of us, you know, wherever it is that we're working, whenever we're thinking, okay, we have to find a new job, or maybe we're thinking about going and looking for a new job. We are going in with this mentality of, yes, we're on these like job boards, these sites, and we're typing in what we're looking for, right? We are effectively job searching. But to think about it as hmm, job shopping, well, first of all, I'm all about shopping, so I like that approach. But it's also a way I feel that feels very empowering in many ways to think, hey, I got control over what I'm looking for and what I will also accept as well. So my guest, Madeline, and I, we are going to be talking all about this. But before that, if this is the first time we are meeting, a quick intro of who I am. So my name is Jessica Chen, and I'm the founder and CEO of Soulcast Media, and we are a communications training company. So we do all things communication skills. Now, before I started Soulcast Media, I actually used to be on TV. I used to be a broadcast TV journalist. All over the states here, I was um, in California at the ABC station in San Diego, but I was actually also in New York for a few years. And then my very first job on air was at NBC in Reno, Nevada. So, and that's kind of like how our career as a journalist, how it goes. We typically have to move from city to city, from station to station. My last stop was at the ABC station in San Diego, which was actually where I won an Emmy award. And for me, that was almost kind of like a career culmination where I was like, okay, I felt like I won that most prestigious award. What do I want to do next? And when I was thinking about that next career move, I just had this like calling of saying communications. And um, for those of you who have heard this story, um, you know, I always talk about this and how I always say communications, it was not something I was good at. Communications was something that I had to learn on the job. Now, I'm not talking about communications with like friends and family because, you know, for me, whenever I'm around people I'm comfortable with, oh my gosh, speaking is super easy, right? It's a lot of like chit chat, we're catching up. But I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but when you are starting a new job, or you're in a meeting and there's maybe some intimidating folks or you're doing a presentation, it takes a whole different set of communication skills that personally I was not taught. Put me in front of people and start presenting. I used to freeze up. Have me pitch my ideas in a team meeting. I had a hard time figuring out, do I chime in now or do I wait? Do I raise my hand or, you know, what do I do? It was a lot of these like awkward, you know, mental chatter in my brain. So long story short, I always joke that because I struggled in communications, starting out in a career that required good communications was almost the best masterclass. So that is what I do now. And I know a lot of this has to do with career as well. So without further ado, let's get started because Madeline and I, we're going to be talking about job shopping and communication skills. So I'm very excited to invite my guest Madeline here. And just so you all know, this event is going to be about 40 minutes or so, and it's very much an event for you. So if you have any questions for Madeline and I uh, related to your career, what you're feeling, you know, what you're seeing, please use a chat function. I know you, many of you have already typed in where you're from, which is amazing. So Madeline is a former HR leader. 
She is also the CEO of Self Made Millennial, which is a career coaching company. And what's also great is Madeline and I, we're actually both working on a book together and we share a same editor, which is honestly amazing. So I'm excited to have Madeline up here. So Madeline, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jessica. And hello, everyone. We have an amazing crowd here today, and I'm so thrilled that you're here with us today. So I know I did a quick intro of who you are, Madeline, but for those of you who don't know you, please introduce yourself. We'd love to learn a little bit more about you. Absolutely. So I come from the human resources field. I was working in the technology industry, and I was leading HR where I was seeing who got hired, who got promoted, and also who slipped through the cracks, who didn't make the cut. And as I was noticing this, I was using, I, I have two psychology degrees. And so I was really noticing, okay, what are the triggers that are leading certain professionals to climbing the ladder quickly and getting exactly what they want to other people falling flat and not landing the job? And it didn't have to do with their pedigree. It didn't have to do with who had necessarily the best skills. It was more who really knew how to play the game, who was the best communicator, who could really mm -hmm. articulate their value. And so I took to YouTube. I started posting videos on YouTube six years ago on a channel called Self Made Millennial. And it was just a hobby. And the success stories from those videos became so uh, intense that I, I ended up leaving my full-time job um, because people kept asking for coaching for me and courses and all these things. And it became so much that I have dedicated my whole life and career to helping job seekers become job shoppers. I love that. And you hit on so many points of there's this you know, unspoken kind of way of approaching the workplace that I think for many of us, and, you know, I completely resonate. I grew up in a culture where I was very much raised to be thinking of, okay, you work hard, you study hard, and you get your job, and then you quietly do the work and those promotions, that recognition, it'll just come. It doesn't just come. No. You really have to fight for it to just advocate for yourself. In fact, I talk a lot about advocating for yourself, but I think for many of us, it is so incredibly hard to do. So, right? So Madeline, what are some of your, I guess, what have you noticed? Like when it comes to working with folks, the things you talk about, what are those key skills that people really need to do that maybe they weren't taught that you have found to be their differentiating factor? Well, a lot of people view the job search and the workplace as having certain rules because many of us, came from academia, right? We were in school for over a decade mm -hmm. and I learned in school, you follow a rubric yeah. and you get an A. So a lot of people, they think, oh, okay. So a company opens a job online. I must then apply to that job and then wait for the company to hopefully reach out to me sometime. And, oh, the job is closed. Well, my opportunity is gone. And if they don't post the job online, then that means there is no job for me to have. So, mm -hmm. so I won't, I won't talk to anyone at that company. These are all lies. None of those things are true. You don't want to just apply online and wait. Um, I, I think that we don't realize that there's so many rules in the job search that are meant to be broken. And in a way that it's not, oh, this person's being really edgy by breaking them. But instead the company says, oh, Thank goodness. You know, you you've actually helped us because we were really busy with this other thing. But I'm so glad you reached out about this role because actually you'd be a really good fit for this other role. And so I think that's one of the major things is too many job seekers just try to fit through the front door, whereas I teach job seekers to go through the chimney and through the back door on the other side and how to shimmy up the, the drain pipe. And that is actually the fastest way to land a job. So I think when you were just talking about that, I was rem I was like thinking back during those periods of time where I would be on, I don't know, you know, the job sites and I would type in that similar role that I was looking for. And then you'd see if you pop up, you'd apply, which already is a huge headache for many of us to like have to input our resume and then upload a new cover letter. And then like what happens? crickets, right? It's so demoralizing. You feel so frustrated and you're like, what the heck, right? Okay. So I love how you're pointing out that that's not necessarily the only way to get a job. And you're saying that there's many other ways. So what have you found to be some 
amazing strategies that maybe some folks are already doing, but it's nice to kind of think about them a little bit more. Do you have any suggestions or even stories of like what has worked? What have you seen work? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think about one of my clients, Gail. When I started working with her, she was 59 years old and she assumed because she was applying to jobs that she was not getting jobs because all these companies were ageist. They just didn't want, you know, a, a worker in her fifties or nearing her sixties. And there was several things that completely transformed for Gail when I worked with her. The first thing was she was just immediately thinking, I need to upskill. She said, I need to get out of accounting. So, but I need to do something else. So, you know, I'm going to get my CPA license or I mm -hmm. am going to get a certification in Tableau. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that job seekers make is again, we go to what's comfortable and what is comfortable is crowded. So it's the thought is I'm just going to get more education. I'm just going to get more certifications. And unfortunately, while some some education and some certifications absolutely are great as a solid baseline, usually that's what it is. It's like a check the box baseline that the rest of your competition has, but that is not the strategy. Yeah. And instead, your your energy and all that could be placed differently. So what we did with Gail instead was first got ultra clear about what is her next career step. I mean, I, <laughs> say me in the chat if you are someone who really knows that you want to make your next career move, but are not quite sure exactly what that is. That is extremely common. And unfortunately, that is often the reason why you are not landing jobs right now is you are unclear. The more, I, you know, Jessica, you, uh, I, you know, just a year ago or so post online, Hey, I want to get in touch with literary agents, yes. right? The reason that you got help right away is because you knew exactly what you wanted. You mm -hmm. made the ask, you had the manuscript, you knew what you wanted. If you had said something like, Hey, you know, I'm looking to make a, an, a big move. Can you introduce me to anyone who might be in like publishing or media or something? You wouldn't get any responses, right? Because it's not specific enough, but you had a vision. And so that's super huge. So that's what I work with um, my clients on is building out a one page career vision, really knowing exactly their next career step. And then finally, we made her irresistible. So once we knew exactly what she wanted, that's when the magic happens. That's when you can make your resume more of a sales page than a Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. And so she started talking about herself in a way that was really compelling to companies. And that is what ended up not only landing her her next job, but her LinkedIn profile, everything like companies just keep coming to her, asking her to work for them. And she's like, I literally thought no one would want me in my age, but that is so false. And she just has a ridiculous amount of opportunity. There's two things that I really want to highlight here. The first one is, so you talked about leveraging LinkedIn and I, I'm a huge, huge, I mean, we're on LinkedIn right now. I'm a huge supporter of how we can utilize this platform a lot more strategically than just updating your title when it comes to a new job. So for those who don't know, the story that Madeline was referring to was about two days ago, I posted this um, story on my LinkedIn profile, sharing with everybody how I was able to get a book deal, which, you know, Matt, and I would love to hear kind of your story too, but like, how did I get a book deal with Penguin Random House? And the story was, I use LinkedIn and I wrote a very short post asking folks, hey, does anybody know any literary agents because I am planning to pitch my book? It was very precise. It was exactly what I was looking for. And people, oh my gosh, I can't even tell you the amount of people who responded, which there's so many kind people. I really do feel that there's so many kind people who they're like, wow, oh, Jessica's looking for this. Oh, I do know somebody. And they started recommending. And then long story short, I got an amazing agent. And then we were off to the races to pitching this book. And then of course I got this book deal with Penguin Random House. But that's the story that Madeline was referring to. It's like, don't be afraid of asking and being very specific. And you know what? If you don't get any response, it's okay. Sometimes you just got to put yourself out there. The second story that you mentioned, Madeline, was this client where you made her so utterly irresistible. And I love how you kind of characterize that because I think for many of us, you're right. We default to, okay, I want to make this next jump. What education, what certification, how do I upskill? Which of course is important, but really it's one of, it's more of those like, you know, intangible skills that can really get you to stand out. So 
can you give us some specific tips on on how you made her so utterly irresistible, Madeline? I think for many of us, we're like dying to know because we want to feel that way too. <laughs> Absolutely. So Jessica, what so many of us have learned to do uh, for our resumes is our resume is a list of the things we've done in the past. And that's not the way I teach people how to write their resumes. I say, forget, like, let's not list out your favorite accomplishments. I actually don't care what you find is most impressive about yourself. Once we know exactly what your next career move is, we are going to really study that profession, study that job description, study that company, and we are going to present only the information that they really want to hear. So I'll give you an example. Let's say that your most recent job was as an executive assistant and about 10% of the job, about 10% of the time you had helped out with scheduling social media posts or making edits or, or anything like that, that just kind of helped uh, with, with some of the, the social media and the marketing. Mm -hmm. If you were then thinking, I really want to go into marketing next. It's my favorite. I've been taking classes on it. I've been doing my own side projects for that executive assistant role. Even though only 10% of your time was social media, a hundred percent of what you talk about for that role will be social media. And that is the piece that so many people don't get. People think, oh, they have autobiography syndrome where they're saying, oh, I love my story. They need to understand why I moved from each job to job and why this and that. No, the company actually doesn't need to know those things. And that's what I transformed with Gail is we were able to see her end, her end goal and basically work backwards from the end goal and say exactly what the company wanted here without lying, of course, but positioning her in a way that totally made companies go, perfect. You've matched A to B exactly what we want to see. And so she easily was able to get lots of interviews. I love that in the sense where I think a lot of us kind of go and fall into this default of this black and white thinking where, okay, 10% of my job is social media. So all, I can only write 10% of that in my resume, but no, you got to double down on what it is that you are looking for and continuously focus on that because you're right. You know, when people are looking at job, um, you know, resumes, they're looking for, does this person have the skills needed to get the job done? And if you're only highlighting just a little bit of what you're looking for, people won't be able to recognize your abilities. So one of the questions that I wanted to, I see that we have some questions coming in and I think this is great. I, I want you all to ask questions. So Nicole is asking, okay, cover letters, are they important, Madeline? What are your thoughts on these? So you'll hear lots of debate online. And what you'll often hear when people talk about cover letters is they start it with I. I never read cover letters. I always read cover letters. And what you have to take away from that is people are different. You know, like it's basically a flip of a coin of whether or not that person's going to read it. If you are applying to a really large company, first of all, you should not be applying online. It's just too crowded. There's no point. But let's say hypothetically you are, it's not likely that they're going to read your cover letter because the volume is so high. If you're applying to like, let's say Jessica, I mean, let's say I wanted to work for you. I would a hundred percent write a cover letter and I would write it about showing up to these soul cast media lives. I would talk about, you know, uh, the different, uh, you know, course, you know, things that you've put out and all this types of stuff. And would do you think you would read that? I would read it because I love that you are focusing on things that I've done and I know you know me. It's personal. To me, that's what stands out. Yeah, and and you're you're a small business, right? And so I think usually when it's a smaller business, that piece is super important. Probably, you know, when you hire people for your team, you really want people who really get the mission and really understand what you're about. And so for smaller businesses, absolutely. So all of this is to say Cover letters can make or break you for sure. I know I used to work in the blockchain industry when blockchain was very new. So let's, I would say maybe like 2015, 2016, when a lot of people didn't know what that word was. And so if someone put in their cover letter, hey, I'm really passionate about cryptocurrency and blockchain, that shot them to the top of the list because 
me having to convince people to be interested in something is not something I wanted to be in the business of. I wanted to hire people who said, oh my gosh, you guys do blockchain. That's so bleeding edge. I want to work for you. And that, those employees were way easier to retain than someone who's like, um, I don't really care. I just want a job and I'll do it anyways. So all of this is to say, yes, cover letters can absolutely be, be impactful. Sometimes they can also be not helpful, but I think to be binary about it, to say, yes, they're bad or yes, they're good is, is, is not a very helpful stance. You said this um, just now where when it comes to big companies to not really put use cover letters or, or you kind of made that statement like maybe it's not as helpful as we think it is, especially those bigger companies. Can you dive a little bit more into that you know, thought process? Yes. So Google, for example, one of the most competitive employers in the world, um, gets 2 million job applications a year. Uh, and really, if you look online, uh, this, and I see comments from job seekers all the time, they tell me this, they say, wow, this job was just posted on LinkedIn yesterday. It already has 500 applications. And that's not a Google, that's just a company. And so really in the end is applying online a good strategy. Absolutely not. It's, you know, I, I work with, with clients who have said, oh, I've applied to 500 roles and haven't really gotten a, a a job offer yet. If you have any sort of statistics background, you'll know that if you have to do something 500 times, you can get a 0% result. That is not an effective strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and so really when you avoid those, those cattle calls of, of job applications where you are getting buried so far in the pile where you're actually, your application is actually really good, but it's just, there's too much noise to get yeah. there. Um, yeah. So you just need to move away from that. Uh, I mean, have you, have you hired recently and seen the absolute, just the resumes and applications that have nothing to do with the roles you're actually hiring for? Oh my gosh. You know, talk about noise and yes, you know, I've have, <laughs> I've posted jobs for, you know, our company and, you know, it's very overwhelming. That's how I would characterize it. It's very overwhelming. The amount of People who apply that also are not qualified, which makes it very distracting for me to identify who is the right person. So trust me, you know, as somebody who hires, I want you, right? Like I want you, I just can't see you. And that's the problem, right? So I do agree that sometimes um, we're applying through the traditional channels. It's, it's second nature. It's what we were taught to do. But I have found that I have been very impressed with folks who have found me in other ways. For example, like LinkedIn on Instagram or whatever email, right? And they'll say like, "Hey, I put." They'll say, "I applied online, but I also want to let you know that I'm reaching out here as well, just so you um, notice me." You know, just the, the fact that they're proactive about it is also a skill as an employer that I hugely value. So the fact that they took the time to find me in all these other areas, I'm like, whoa, that's a go-getter. And of course that made them stand out to me. So you, Jessica, you bring up something really important here because a lot of job seekers who are probably watching this right now are saying, oh, you know, that doesn't seem like it will work. And, you know, I've done that before and it didn't work. Here's the thing is that if you have ever hired and seen the behind the scenes of applications, Jessica, I can guarantee even if you got a thousand applications, a lot of people don't give a hoot about working with you. They just, they just apply, they just saw an open job and they clicked a button and they didn't read the job description. I know once I opened up um, job applications for a role, I knew was going to get an absolute onslaught of applications. And I just put a simple direction in it. It wasn't even hidden. I was just like, Hey, just include this, this in your application. Only 20% of people did that. Only 20% of people read the job description. And this is something that you'll see duplicated across a lot of applicant tracking systems is most people don't read it. And so instantly, the people who read the job description, they were only competing with 20% of the full volume of the hundreds of people. And that's what people should realize is, is that anything you can do to show, hey, I'm not actually someone who's spamming you with, with a resume that has nothing to do with this job. I intentionally applied and I actually think what you're doing, Jessica, is really legit. That does make a difference. Yeah. 
so for those who are listening, you know, I imagine many of you are very intentional. You know, you find a job you like and you really want it, right? You're not one of those like spammers who's just trying to like put your resume out there, throw it out into the wind and see what lands, right? I imagine many of us, you know, we care, right? And so I think for you all, the takeaway is to think about, okay, how can I be strategic about this? How can I not just go the traditional one-way path that I've been taught and find other ways to reach out to people? And you know, we were sharing earlier about using LinkedIn, finding folks, in mailing, I think that's what it's called, in mailing them, you know, just letting them know like, hey, I'm here, I'm interested, I'm not just one of the other hundreds of people who are applying, like this is me, this is why I like you, this is what, you know, or here's another thing, and this is what we can talk about too, which is I think really important is the the ability to also um, connect with folks in your network because you also don't know what that could potentially lead to. So Madeline, what are your thoughts on that? Like, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day because they were actually in the job search market and I was suggesting like, hey, is there anybody that you've previously loved working with that you can say, hey, I'd love to just catch up and just chat and just kind of like see how you're doing and like approaching it like that as a way to get a gauge of like, what's the market like? You know, do they see any opportunities? But what are your thoughts on reaching out to people as a way of finding a job too? So a lot of my clients land jobs that never hit job boards. And Jessica, have you ever had a job that did what that was either you were given it, you know, because you met someone and they're like, hey, Jessica, will create a job for you or or, you know, you met it through a friend or your friend was leaving that job and they were like, hey, Jessica, you should talk to my boss. Has that ever happened to you? Let me think. You know, I'm just thinking back from my news days. I feel like I remember I was very, so I was very proactive in trying to attend a lot of the, so for us, we had a lot of like associations of like other journalists. So yes, in many ways we would come together and it was like a networking thing. And like, you know, oh, I know this person at this television station. I know this person. And even if that person didn't necessarily get me a job, at least I could say, oh, I know this person who works at this company. And whether that person knows that person or not, the fact that you have already kind of shared a commonality, I think that's that's kind of like a human nature kind of thing that you can kind of like name drop people like, oh, I have a friend who works here in this department. And sometimes that's all you have to say, really. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, a lot of uh, even the roles, like I just hired someone um, who she adores my coaching program so much. She went through it. She got incredible results. She was able to change her career, landed in her new job. And she came back to us, um, to our team. And she said, seeing you all coach in that program, she's like, something is telling me I need to work for you guys. Something is, something is calling to me that I need to do this. And so because of her persistence, because of her clear vision of what she wanted, we actually ended up just creating a role for her in our business and extending an offer. And this happens all the time. And it doesn't have to be that complex where you've actually taken the program. It, you know, it can be a lot more simple than that. It can be a lot more of just Hey, I just met someone and they have a need. And instead of opening up a job wreck and being flooded with applications, you can be in a, a, you know, a league of your own where it's, they're just deciding, should we hire this person? Yes or no versus should we hire this person versus the other hundreds of people? And so, yes, I would say building relationships and tapping into that hidden job market is one of the most fruitful and one of the fastest ways to land a job, but it doesn't feel fast because what feels fast is hitting apply on another job, is um, clicking through another LinkedIn learning course, which I love LinkedIn learning courses, but you should take them to build yourself versus get some sort of certification, like really do it to 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 enrich yourself. And so that's that's something that I think a lot of people will steer away from is the relationship building, but it can be so incredible. And there's obviously there's very specific strategies of how to do it right. Um, a lot of people will kind of do it in a not so great way, but it's it's a huge piece of job searching. I think a lot of what Madeline and I are talking about is, you know, thinking about approaching your job search in a more strategic way. Like I think Madeline and I are, 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 we're kind of basically sharing like what other ways you can cut through the noise so you can stand out. Now, I want to, I want to pivot a little bit because, you know, there are some folks who I'm sure are curious about, well, 
What if I see a company and I love this company? I love their mission. I'm all about it. I really, really want to work here. So it's like you feel very much connected to the mission of this company. And you are just like, gosh, I really don't want to just get lost. So the first question is, do I convey that in a cover letter, right? Do I write that? I'm so passionate. I'm, I, I feel very aligned. And do I put that in a cover letter? And then how can I make sure that they really do see me? Because I want them to know that I'm dying to work for this company. So what are your thoughts on this? So, you know, the, the simple way to say it is absolutely. Sharing your interest in a company never hurts. It's so important. And putting that in a cover letter, putting that in the message to the hiring manager, um, saying it in your interview as to why that business really resonates with you is, is really important. Going back to my example of when I worked in the blockchain industry, that was worth a lot. That was like worth half your grade is being like, yes, like I've already self-educated on this technology and I'm super committed to going into this, this industry and um, committing myself to this. That being said, Jessica, what I see from so many people is they get enchanted by these jobs and these companies that we all love. Like, let's say you love wearing Nike sneakers and you write something about how, oh, I think Nike is so cool and I love your marketing and I love your products and they're so cool. I'm telling you right now, Nike gets about a thousand of those cover letters a day. Um, you talk about that with Disney. Oh, I love Disney. Disney's so magical. It's been a part of my childhood. Honestly, like that is so common that it's not going to make you stand out. And I also talk to people in the entertainment industry. Uh, oh, it was someone, it was someone who was actually worked in sports. And he said, he worked for the NFL. And he said, if someone came into the interview and was like, I love football, I love football. It's like, yes. So does every other candidate. What else do you bring to the table? So that's the only thing that I, I really want to address here is it, it's, it's, it's important if what you like is not normal to like, like, like liking blockchain is not normal. Um, it's getting more normal, but it, it, it was definitely not then. Um, if you, if what you like is a little bit more niche, but if it's very mainstream and it's something that kind of is a very competitive area, you have to show something greater than that. You have to show that you intimately understand Mikey's marketing approach and why that really compelled you to become a digital marketer. It needs to go deeper. One of the questions that I think a lot of people are also wondering is, okay, I see a job that I love. I want to apply for it, but I'm not 100% the perfect fit for that job. You know, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, we had that example of that, you know, executive assistant who wanted to be a social media manager. And even though her job was only 10% of it now, you know, we talked about highlighting it. But Madeline, what are some of your tips when it comes to folks who are like, yes, I really want to pivot. I know I'm not 100% there in terms of the skills, the qualifications. Should I still go for it? And then how can I position myself for it? Yeah, I would say that this is the number one scenario I work with clients on because so many people are multi-passionate. Um, so maybe they went for a career earlier and it wasn't the right choice, or maybe it was the right choice for that moment in their life. And now they want to pivot. I mean, Jessica, you're a perfect example of someone who has very gracefully pivoted. And so um, what's important here is to get extremely clear about what actually matters. Uh, you know, and I saw a bunch of people in the comments talking about this, about how, you know, they're, they're excited to get their education. They've been getting lots of certifications, but do those certifications actually matter in making you more compelling? That's the first thing you need to understand. Don't just skill up and, and, and get more uh, education just because you think that's the right thing. Um, the second piece is that you that companies are, you really have to translate your experience and you'd be so surprised at how, even if you haven't worked in that career before, if you do a great job of illustrating your transferable skills, they will hire you. I think about my client, Paula, who went from being a relationship coach, which she thought was her dream job, but she realized there's so many pieces of it that she didn't like to being a customer success um, representative. She was applying for customer success roles. And I said, Paula, like I looked at her background, I said, you have over a decade of, of work experience, you could be a manager. And she said, that is bonkers. I can't change careers and be a manager and like manage other people who've already been in this career. That's that doesn't make any sense. But positioning her the right way, um, showing how she actually had 
a lot of the customer success success skills in her previous work. I mean, working as a relationship coach, there was so much of that that could be very easily transferable if you do it the right way, right? A lot of us don't do it the right way. And um, so by positioning herself that way and then branding herself that way, too many of us focus on our past Mm -hmm. and we feel like that was a part of us. Like, Like if I see a headline where someone says, teacher, mom, and then like digital marketing professional. And like, they're not looking for teaching roles. They're not looking for, you know, to get the best mom of the year role. They're looking for digital marketing roles. Why aren't you claiming that? Like, why is, why are you taking so long to get there? And like teacher, teacher was your past career. Why are you, why are you telling everyone, Hey, I used to be, it's just such confusing messaging. So that's something I work with people a lot on is getting the messaging clear, getting it crisp, getting it compelling, and then giving people the confidence to own it. I love that. It's thinking, it's forward thinking, not thinking in the past, even though that might be what you're comfortable with. It's what you know, but you're thinking next steps. So you want to be sure to highlight that because you cannot assume people are going to know, okay, you were a teacher. I understand that, but what does this have to do with this job that you're looking for? Right. If if it's not clear, if it's not, people don't get it within seconds, then what's going to happen, right? People are just going to move on. And that's just, that's just the thing. So you talked about branding. I want to talk about communications because this is what I love talking about. This is what we work with people on. And I'm sure you have a lot of tips when it comes to interviewing and how to talk about yourself. So, and I will, this is where I will definitely share my own strategy. So one of the things that I think people get really nervous about are interviews, sitting face to face with somebody who they're like, oh my God, I only have 15, 20, 30 minutes to make an impression. So Madeline, for you, what do you find are, well, there's so many ways I can go about this. And I feel like so many people have so many questions, but you know, what have you found to be some of the best strategies for when people are interviewing? And then afterwards, I'd love to share my own thoughts on how we can communicate a little bit better. Right. When I work with clients, this idea of being a job shopper really is this idea that you and the company are equals. Too many people go into the job interview thinking, I hope they choose me and I am going to memorize the top 10 interview questions and I'm going to deliver the best possible answer I can. And this actually is what is sabotaging your ability to land the job. Maybe if you're entry level or really early, that might work. But as you get into more senior level roles, they're looking for someone who is going to really engage in a dialogue. They're looking for someone with critical thinking. And they're also looking for someone who they like. And, you know, that is something that I think a lot of us really have challenges with is when I watch my clients, you know, in their early stages of doing mock interviews, they have this thing I call interview voice where you you are trying to be so professional and remember your lines of what to say in the interview that it comes off so cold. Like if I came onto this live today, I was like, hello, Jessica, it is so nice to be here. Three tips to improve in the interview are, and I don't know, you wouldn't, you'd be like, who is this person? You know, all, all of our wonderful viewers would just be like, uh, she, I don't like this woman. I can't tell you why I don't like her, but I just don't like her. And that is unfortunately the way a lot of us show up to interviews. Yes. It's what we call people thinking about the power distance between us and them because they have the hiring capabilities. Therefore, we kind of put them on this pedestal of like, we got to impress, we got to do this, right? But that's all we think about, right? And you talked about this likability. And I know sometimes people are like, ooh, like that's so like, how can you make that a, a, a characteristic or a judgment of how and why we should hire somebody? But you're right. And I think in terms of like the higher people go and the more work experience they have, people want to work with people who they feel that they are comfortable engaging with. Do they feel like, hey, if they reach out to you, will you be able to engage with them? So when it comes to interviews, and this is kind of where I want to talk a little bit about communications and get your thoughts on this too, Madeline, is like, 
treat it as a conversation. You know, as much as you are talking about yourself, job shopping, which is what our topic is, it's also being sure that you're figuring out, is this a right fit for you? And there's always that opportunity in interviews for you to like try to get to understand this company a little bit more. So again, it's less about that power distance between you and them, but it's like, hey, is this something that I would be interested in? Is this something that would fit? And, you know, never go in thinking like, oh my God, like, you know, I'm just so desperate that I just have to accept anything because that's one mm -hmm. of the worst things, right? You start a job because you feel you're so desperate for it. But then what happens? A few months in, you're like, whoa, this is not for me. And then what happens? You start all over again, right? So, you know, when it comes to interviews, very much think it is both. It's both ways. They have to want you. You have to want them. And more importantly, you, and that's the thing, you have to feel like it's a great fit. Because like I said, to do it any other way, it's like, gosh, like it's not, you're not doing yourself a service by just accepting anything because you're just like, I just need something. Mm -hmm. It's so true. And yeah, it's in the end, if you're treating the interview, like talking to a coworker, something unlocks in your brain where you're not thinking about it as this, as this awkward dynamic. And one of the things I teach my clients to do is guiding the interview. So when I tell people that you can guide the, the direction of the interview, people say, no, 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 Madeline, I, you know, I, I, that will be seen as me trying to hijack the interview or I'm interviewing in government roles where it's very structured interviewing. And I say this has actually worked in government and beyond and every every interview in between. It's not about changing the subject or, you know, telling them, no, 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 I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about this. It's about knowing exactly what you want to say going into that interview and guiding your answers towards those key points. Because what I found and I've trained a lot of people to be interviewers. So obviously I, I train people to, you know, be job seekers and all that. But I come from an HR background. I was training people how to interview. Most people are terrible at interviewing and yeah. don't ask very good questions. So you can actually give them even better answers than what they asked for. This is huge. And I want to preface this by saying this is exactly one of the, the techniques that we talk about too. It's that you are being strategic with the certain, you know, the key words, key words that you are dropping in how you answer it so that the other side can go, oh, they said this word and it triggered something in me that sparked a curiosity that now I want to know more. But again, even though it may not have fit perfectly into that one question that they are asking, you can still make it the way you want to make it. You know, how you can do this seamlessly is if, if somebody asks you a question, you can still answer that question, but don't just end that question there. Continue on by saying like, and it also made me think of this other project that I've done and it resulted in this. So you're basically taking one question that they're asking, but you're making it your own, just exactly what you're saying too. It's so powerful. Exactly. You should always answer the question. Like that's, that's something that is sometimes when, when I give this advice, people go a little bit like, Oh, what is my greatest weakness? Well, my weakness is actually a strength. And it's like, no, 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 no. Okay. No, you're taking this away. Like literally, like you should give them a weakness, like, but, but make, you know, blah, blah, blah. So exactly. It's, it's, you don't want to skirt it, but if there's in the interview, small nuances generate exaggerated results. And what we're talking about right now are these nuances that are going to blow them out of the water. They're going to have no idea that you're doing this, but they're going to walk away from the interview saying that was the best interview of the day. It's funny because, um, you know, when I think about when I interview folks for positions that we have here, I always think like, there are some people who are just such good talkers, but they don't have the skills. And there are some people who have the skills that are not great talkers. And I think like for me as a person who's interviewing both people, you know, I have to, it's like finding that balance, right? Obviously I want to find somebody who has all the skills, but their ability to communicate and talk about themselves is also very important too. So I think for any of us who are listening right now, it's like, how can I find this balance of being able to present myself in a certain way, but also be able to show that I know and I have the skills. Okay. 
I can't believe this, but we're almost nearing the end of this chat, which is crazy because I feel like we have, we have, there's so much more we can talk. We should have like a part two or something yeah. like this. But as we wrap up here, Madeline, do you have any kind of like last minute, I call them golden nuggets, golden nuggets of folks, of, of tips that you would love people to walk away with so they can remember whether they're job shopping right now or not? I would say that really job shopping is all about knowing exactly what you want and getting on the same side of, of the table as the company and being irresistible to companies. Like when, what I want for every person watching right now is for companies to sell them on opportunities. And people will hear me say that and think, well, not in this job market. I can't, I, I just need to get, and you said this earlier, Jessica, I just need to take what I can get. And companies don't want that. They actually want the best possible talent and they will even pay more if they think you are better than the other candidates because um, they know how important that is. And they're scared to hire anyone who isn't above, a, uh, that isn't below a certain bar. So um, that is super, super important. And that's, I mean, a lot of my clients, they'll they'll land salaries above the stated salary range, even, even in this job market. And so that is what I really want to instill in people's heads is if it's comfortable, if it's crowded, then it's crowded. Stop kind of going for these, these really cattle call approaches and start job shopping in a way where you elevate yourself. You put yourself forward for these really great opportunities and you get companies selling you on the opportunities. I love that. And I think for me, if there was any kind of like last minute golden nuggets that I'd want people to walk away with from this event is knowing that you have so many different avenues in terms of finding the job that you want that is in that traditional path. And I know we talked a bit about this because the truth is, there's so much noise out there. I mean, even internally, you know, if we're working at a company now, like you can see like how there's just so many different distractions that can prevent people from being focused. So for you, you know, if you're thinking about that next move, it's knowing that yes, finding and using those traditional job boards to find that new position. But once you find them, what other ways can you reach out to people, recruiter or not really, I think, you know, recruiter or not people who are maybe in that department that you're interested in working for? How can you get their attention because that's what it is at the end of the day. You can be the perfect candidate, but if you cannot get people's attention, you are just one of 100, 200, 300 applicants, right? Even though you are the most qualified, but not just that, even if you're not the most qualified and you want something, you can still reach out to people and find ways to get noticed because that's what I really have realized in this, you know, I've had to also kind of get rid of my, you know, old way of thinking of like, oh, if they don't reach out to me, it must mean that I'm not good. It's not that. It's just because there's so much else out there that people have to sift through that can really just, you know, prevent you from being seen. So number one, yeah, don't feel discouraged. You just got to get creative sometimes. And number two, you know, like I said, you like use LinkedIn because it's such a powerful platform that I, and I know you and I, Madeline, we use this in many different ways. And I think it's been very fruitful for us. So for you all, don't just think of it as a way to like post, you know, your, your newest job, you know, find ways to engage in conversations. People notice this stuff. So Oh, and then the last one is just thinking about communication skills. Of course, no matter what job you're in, what industry you're in, I do think communications is something that everyone can improve in, whether it's interview or just like communicating in the workplace. So Madeline, um, where can people find you? How can they get in touch with you? I know some folks are saying, yes, a part two, we should maybe really talk about that, but how can people get in contact with you? Absolutely. Well, definitely follow me on LinkedIn, Madeline Mann, as well as head over to my website, www.madelinemann.com. I have lots of free resources on there, free workshops, all like tons of stuff. Um, and definitely follow the YouTube channel, Self Made Millennial. That is where hundreds of thousands of people have said that they've gotten amazing success stories. I love that. So be sure to follow her there because I know, Madeline, you're always dropping these, I call them golden nuggets for folks because, you know, for us, like, and I think for both of us, like, we just want to help support people to feel like there are other ways that, you know, they can improve themselves, get themselves noticed. So please follow Madeline if you don't already. And if you haven't, if any of you are don't follow me, be sure to follow me here on LinkedIn as well. I'm always talking about communication skills, specifically communication skills and how we can just be better presenters, carry ourselves, develop executive 
executive presence, you know, kind of topics like that. That's what I always talk about. So if we're not already connected, please connect with me on LinkedIn. And just so you all know, I host these every other week or so. And we have a fantastic guest in about two weeks where, of course, we are continuing to talk about communication skills. So if you want to get in touch and, you know, you want to stay updated, go to our website, soulcastmedia.com, because that's how you can get notified of all our events. So Madeline, thank you. I'm so grateful for you. And thank you so much for spending the time with us. And everybody who joined us today, thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much.